Um, stem cell research has come a long way during the past decade in generating many cell types that are either dysfunctional or missing in many degenerative diseases. So the next step really, and the focus of the Harvard Stem Cell Institute for the coming decade is to transplant these cells into people. There is one major barrier to transplantation. It's immune rejection. So during transplantation, if the cells are not exactly If the cells are not exactly genetically matched, or even if they are to the recipient, they will suffer immune rejection. And so I have this video of a sandcastle being taken away by the sea. So no matter how pure or how functional your transplanted cells are, if they're not adequate to not be rejected by the recipient's immune system, they will just fade away. And this problem is particularly important in autoimmune diseases, such as type 1 diabetes, because in that case, the recipient's immune system has actually evolved to recognize its own insulin-producing pancreatic beta cells and seek and destroy them. So it's highly desirable to be able to induce immune tolerance, that is, unresponsiveness of the immune system towards a certain antigen. And ideally, that immune tolerance would be local, so you can avoid side effects of systemic immune suppression, such as increased uh, um, susceptibility to cancer or to infections. And so luckily, there's a special case in nature where immune tolerance is induced at a very precise anatomical location for many months. And that case is pregnancy. So during pregnancy, you have a fetus that is 50% foreign to the mother. And so by every law of solid organ transplantation, it should be rejected. But it isn't. It stays there for nine months when it is nurtured. If you are to transplant a foreign organ to the same pregnant mother, it will be rejected. So there is something special about this case that prevents the immune rejection. And so we don't fully know how it works, but we know something. We know that the rock star cell type here, I hate to tell you this, is not any kind of stem cell. It's a trophoblast. So trophoblasts during pregnancy, they deeply invade the maternal tissue, the uterine decidua, and they remodel the spiral arteries to ensure proper blood flow into the fetus. And so this trophoblast, there is one gene that is only expressed in this trophoblast, and that gene is HLEG. HLEG is a non-classical MHC class one molecule, and so unlike other major histochemically complex MHC molecules, it is not involved in eliciting T cell responses against foreign or viral peptides. It's actually involved in inducing immune tolerance in this case, in a very precise location at the maternal fetal interface. During this process, the whole maternal immune system at this interface is reprogrammed such that now macrophages and natural killer cells are involved in remodeling this whole interface instead of killing. And so this has been known for two decades that this gene is expressed specifically in this cell type, but the mechanisms behind that fact are not clearly understood. So we set ourselves to find out how that works. And so we reason because it's a cell type specific gene that there has to be enhanced or enhanced that are cell type specific. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the reported gene assays where you take your candidate elements, you clone them upstream of a promoter and luciferase, and that's your report your gene. So you can measure luciferase activity as a proxy for your element activity. So now imagine doing this not 10, not 100, not 1,000, but 12,000 elements at once. And so this is what we did. It's called Massively Parallel Reporter Assay. And it's in collaboration with Tarji Mickelson at the Broad Institute. And so what we did is we, uh, we used microarray-based DNA synthesis to synthesize 121 base pair tiles that cover the entire locus. And then we cloned these 12,000 elements into a complex library of 12,000 plasmids that the only thing they differ at is a small RNA-seq tag. And this allows us to, after transfection, be able to trace back the activity of every single element tested back to it. So we have our RNA output, and in this case, we use this trophoblast cell line, JAK3 cells, with an HLG positive trophoblast cell line, and then, as I told you, use RNA seq to count the tag and be able to tell which element is the most effective enhancer. Many details missing. You're welcome to come to my poster number seven. And so during this process, it worked. We found an enhancer element, which we named enhancer L for long range, which is 12 KB 
upstream of facial aging. So we screen 12,000 elements to find an element 12,000 base pairs upstream of facial aging. Even I won't forget that. And so with only three slides, it's hard to tell all these parental details, especially if you use most of your slides just for art. But I'm going to walk you through the major highlights of our research for the past three years. So what have we learned? So we found this enhancer that is in this locus and has activity. So now the next question is, does it matter for my gene of interest? And it turns out it does tremendously. When you use CRISPR-Cas9 to delete a single 101 base pair region from the genome, HLG expression is completely gone. And we did this not only in our trophoblast cell line, but also in primary cells. So we are able to isolate trophoblasts from pregnancy interruption samples. We get them every Tuesday. In addition, we want to know if any other gene is affected. Maybe you just somehow messed up with the locus. So we did a whole transcriptome RNA-seq analysis with John Ray's lab, and we found that HLAG and no other gene is affected when you delete this 100 base pair piece of DNA. So it's important for your gene of interest, and it's specific. We also did some experiments to kind of get at the second canonical property of an enhancer. So if you know there's two, you can act at the distance, and the orientation should not matter, according to Mark Tash in his original work. And so we found it as well. It also works inverted. So now I have this enhancer. Then the next step was to see, okay, what binds to it, and does it loop into the promoter? Because enhancers, to be able to communicate with the gene of interest, they should be able to loop and so be connected in a three-dimensional structure of the genome. And that turns out to be the case. We did some pretty experiments, again, more details at my poster, that show that this enhancer loops into the class of normal facial AG. And this looping seems to be mediated by CBP and GATA factors. And GATA factors have been previously involved in chromatin looping. They are zinc finger transcription factors. They so have two zinc finger domains. So they can bring different regions of one DNA molecule in close proximity. So we now know that HLAG expression functions by a fundamentally different mechanism from all other MHC genes. All MHC genes that are expressed virtually in all our nucleated cells, their expression is controlled mainly by this classical, as we call it, promoter. While this gene, the classical promoter of HLAG, has accumulated different, different mutations during evolution, it looks like, and so an enhancer arose that is only present in the great apes. This enhancer has arose to like make it tissue specific. So we know this, our understanding is far from complete. These transcription factors are normally cell type specific. So we think there might be something else going on. So at the present moment, I'm standing here, and I am not able to turn on HLAG wherever I want. So one question, an additional question that arises in this work is, so I, I, it's, it's seeming as if you know, immune tolerance during pregnancy is a cell intrinsic property of trophoblasts. And there is some data suggesting that is the case. That is, if you transplant trophoblasts somewhere else, so the kidney caps will come up, they still survive. They will recruit vascularization just like at the maternal field interface, and they'll make a nice big graft. But so the question is, does mom have the same fetal invasion in immune tolerance? And the answer is yes, she does. So it turns out that trophoblasts, when they invade the maternal tissue, they come in contact with the maternal blood flow and exposed to several factors. And one of those factors is progesterone, which is the master hormone in pregnancy. Without progesterone, you cannot have pregnancy. And so it turns out that we found that progesterone is able to upregulate HLAG expression trophoblasts. So this is data here at the mRNA level. And so the question then became, how does this work? How do trophoblasts upregulate HLAG expression in response to progesterone? We all know that progesterone traditionally acts through a nuclear receptor, as mentioned earlier today, and will then turn on gene expression. But trophoblasts do not express the progesterone receptor. In addition, if you look at the time scale over there, this is an hour, you see that the maximum effect is after one hour of treatment. And then if you go down to 12 hours or two days, the effect is gone. That's not compatible with the idea of a hormone. So there must be something else going on. So it turns out that there is a second pathway or class of pathways through which progesterone can act. And those are the non-genomic membrane progesterone receptors, which were identified, they're most closely in the brain, but they're also expressed by trophoblasts. And so we now think that trophoblasts actually act through these membrane progesterone receptors, and then this will then result in an increase in HLG expression. And then I'll just show you one example, PGRMC1 and 2, progesterone membrane components. It is expressed in trophoblasts, but actually there is a whole class of receptors that we have to test. 
And so, as you can see here, there's also MPRs, memory protection receptors, alpha, beta, and gamma, because they're close to GPCRs, between GM2 and 1 and 2. And actually, while I was procrastinating preparing for this talk, I actually found a third family of receptors that are expressed in sperm cells, and they are again membrane progesterone receptors that mediate non genomic action of progesterone, so ADHD2, etc. So, a different class of receptors that we're trying to dissect to see which one will mediate this defect on HLV expression. In addition, we're also testing analogs of progesterone to see if we can find a more potent inducer of HLV. Because you can imagine that if you're able to somehow replicate the immune tolerance inducing properties of trophoblasts for transplantation, you would be able to induce a stage of immune privilege during a graft for, for life. And in addition, you can also think that if you have a scaffold, so not only is it transplanted cells, but also the scaffold that goes to those cells, if you can also include the in that preparation. So with this, I would like to thank my PhD supervisors, Jack Strong and Chad Cowan, other people also in my poster, number seven, uh, thank you all for your attention. I'm happy to take questions.